Act Three of A Midsummer Night's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Act Three. Scene One. The Wood. Titania lying asleep. Enter Quince, Snug, Bottom, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Are we all met? Pet, pet, and here's a marvellous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage, this hawthorn break our tiring house, and we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Permus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Permus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. I want to see you that. By your lakin, a parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue and let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords and that pyramus is not killed indeed and for the more better assurance tell them that i pyramus am not pyramus but bottom the weaver this will put them out of fear well we will have such a prologue and it shall be written in eight and six no make it two more let it be written in eight and eight Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in, God, shield us. A lion, among ladies, is a most dreadful thing. For there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck and he himself must speak through saying thus or to the same defect ladies or fair ladies i would wish you or i would request you or i would entreat you not to fear not to tremble my life for yours if you think i come hither as a lion it were pity of my life no I am no such thing. I am a man, as other men are. And there indeed let him name his name, and tell them plainly he is Snug the Joiner. Well, it shall be so. But there is two hard things. That is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber. For you know Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine that night we play our play? <gasps> a calendar! A calendar. Look in the almanac. Find out moonshine. Find out moonshine. Yes, it doth shine that night. Why? Then may you leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play. Open. And the moon may shine in at the casement. Aye, or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lanthorn, and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyramus and Thisbe, says the story, did talk through the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Mm, some man or other must present wall, and let him have some plaster, or some loam, or some rough cast about him to signify wall, and let him hold his fingers thus. And through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come sit down every mother's son and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so every one according to his cue. Enter Puck behind. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What? A play toward. I'll be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Speak, Pyramus. Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savours sweet. Odors, odors. Odors, savours sweet. 
so hath thy breath, my dearest Thisby dear. But hark, a voice, stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. Exit. A stranger pyramus than e'er played here. Exit. Must I speak now? I marry must you, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard, and is to come again. Most radiant Pyramus, most lily-white of hue, of colour like the red rose on triumph of briar, most brisky juvenile, and eke, most lovely Jew, as true as true as horse that never yet would tire, I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninna's tomb, man. Why, you must not speak that yet. Let your answers to Pyramus. You speak all your parts at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is past. It is never tire. Oh! As true as true is horse, that yet would never tire. Re-enter Puck, and Bottom with an ass's head. If I were fair, this be, I were only thine. O monstrous, O strange, we are haunted. Pray, masters, fly, masters, help. Exeunt Quince, Snug, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. I'll follow you, I'll lead you about around, through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire, and neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. Exit. Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me afeard. Re-enter Snout. O oh, Bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Exit Snout. Re-enter Quince. Bless thee, Bottom. Bless thee. Thou art translated. Exit. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me. To fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing, that they shall hear I am not afraid. <coughs> the owl cock so black of hue, with orange tawny bill, the throstle with his note so true, the wren with little co-will. <coughs> what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain sun cuckoo grey, whose note full many a man doth mark, and dares not answer, nay! For indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry, cuckoo, never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamoured of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Methinks, mistress, you shall have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbours will not make them friends. Nay, I can gleek upon occasion thou art as wise as thou art beautiful not so neither but if i had wit enough to get out of this wood i have enough to serve mine own turn out of this wood do not desire to go thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no i am a spirit of no common rate the summer still doth tend upon my state and i do love thee therefore Go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness so, that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom, cobweb, moth and mustard seed. Enter Peas blossom, cobweb, moth and mustard seed. Ready! And I. And I. And I. Where, Where shall, shall we, we go? go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs and mulberries. 
the honey bags steal from the humble bees, and for night tapers crop their waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes, to have my love to bed and to arise, and pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes, nod to him elves and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal! Hail! 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 I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb. I shall desire you of more acquaintance, good master Cobweb. If I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, honest gentleman? Peace Blossom. I pray you, commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and a master peace god, your father. Good master Peace Blossom, I shall desire you of more acquaintance too. Your name, I beseech you, sir. Mustard Seed. Good Master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly giant like ox beef hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you, your kindred had made my eyes water ere now. I desire your more acquaintance, good Master Mustard Seed. Come, wait upon him, lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my love's tongue, bring him silently. Exeunt. Scene two. Another part of the wood. Enter Oberon. I wonder if Titania be awaked. Then, what it was that next came in her eye, which she must dote on in extremity. Enter Puck. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love. Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for the great Theseus's nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented, in their sport forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, an ass's knoll I fixed on his head. Anon his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes. When they him spy, as wild geese that the creeping fowler eye, or russet pated truffs, many in sort, rising and cawing at the gun's report, sever themselves and madly sweep the sky, so at his sight away his fellows fly. And at our stamp, here o'er and o'er one falls, he murder cries and help from Athens calls. Their sense thus weak, lost with their fears thus strong, made senseless things begin to do them wrong, for briars and thorns at their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats, from yield as all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there, when in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked, and straight away loved an ass. This falls out better than I could devise. But hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with the love-juice, as I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, that is finished too, and the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked, of force, she must be eyed. Enter Hermia and Demetrius. Stand close. This is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. Oh, why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse, for thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being o'er shoes in blood, plunge in the deep, and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon this whole earth may be bored, and that the moon may through the centre creep, and so displease her brother's noontide with antipodes. It cannot be but thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look, so dead, so grim. So should the murdered look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I had rather give his carcass to my hounds. 
Out, dog, out, cur, thou drivest me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. Oh, once tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Durst thou have looked upon him being awake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? Oh, brave touch! Could not a worm, an adder, do so much? An adder did it, for with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent, never adder stung. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more, and from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no. Exit. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, For debt that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, Which now in some slight measure it will pay, If for his tender here I make some stay. Lies down and sleeps. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite, And laid the love-juice on some true love's sight. Of thy misprison must perforce ensue Some true love turned, and not a false turn true. Then fate o'er rules that one man holding troth A million fail, confounding oath on oath. About the wood go swifter than the wind, And Helena of Athens look thou find. All fancy sick she is, and pale of cheer, With sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. By some illusion see thou bring her here, I'll charm his eyes against she do appear. I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than arrow from the Tartar's bow. Exit. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink in apple of his eye. When his love he doth espy, let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Re-enter Puck. Captain of our fairy band, Helena is here at hand, and the youth mistook by me, pleading for a lover's fee. Shall we their fond pageant see? Lord, what fools these mortals be! Stand aside. The noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. Then will two at once woo one. That must needs be sport alone. And those things do best please me that befall preposterously. Enter Lysander and Helena. Why should you think that I should woo in scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow I weep, and vows so born, in their nativity all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, oh devilish holy fray, these vows are Hermia's. Will you give her o'er? Weigh oath with oath, and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to her and me put in two scales will even weigh, and both as light as tails. I had no judgment when to her I swore. Nor none in my mind now you give her o'er. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. Oh, Helena, goddess, nymph, perfect divine, to what, my love, shall I compare thine eyne? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripen show thy lips, those kissing cherries tempting grow, that pure congealed white high Taurus snow, fanned with the eastern wind, turns to a crow when thou holdst up thy hand. Oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. Oh, spite, oh, hell, I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil in new courtesy, you would not do me this much injury. Can you not hate me, as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me, too? If you were men as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so, to vow and swear and super-praise my parts, when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena, a trim exploit, a manly enterprise, to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience all to make you sport. You are unkind, Demetrius, be not so, for you love Hermia. This you know I know. 
and here with all good will with all my heart in hermia's love i yield you up my part and yours of helena to me bequeath whom i do love and will do till my death never did mockers waste more idle breath lysander keep thy hermia i will none if e'er i loved her all that love is gone my heart to her but as guest-wise sojourned and now to helen is it home returned there to remain helen it is not so disparage not the faith thou dost not know lest to thy peril thou abide it dear look where thy love comes yonder is thy dear re-enter hermia dark night that from the eye his function takes the ear more quick of apprehension makes wherein it doth impair the seeing sense it pays the hearing double recompense thou art not by mine eye lysander found mine ear i thank it brought me to thy sound but why unkindly didst thou leave me so why should he stay whom love doth press to go what love could press lysander from my side lysander's love that would not let him bide fair helena who more engilds the night than all you fiery o's and eyes of light why seek'st thou me could not this make thee know the hate i bear thee made me leave thee so you speak not as you think it cannot be lo she is one of this confederacy now i perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me injurious hermia most ungrateful maid have you conspired have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision is all the counsel that we two have shared the sisters vows the hours that we have spent when we have chid the hasty-footed time for parting us oh is it all forgot all school days friendship childhood innocence we hermia like two artificial gods have with our needles created both one flower both on one sampler sitting on one cushion both warbling of one song both in one key as if our hands our sides voices and minds had been incorporate so we grow together like to a double cherry seeming parted but yet a union in partition two lovely berries moulded on one stem so with two seeming bodies but one heart two of the first like coats in heraldry do but to one and crowned with one crest and will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend it is not friendly it is not maidenly our sex as well as i may chide you for it though i alone do feel the injury i am amazed at your passionate words i scorn you not it seems that you scorn me have you not set lysander as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face and made your other love demetrius who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess nymph divine and rare precious celestial wherefore speaks he this to her he hates and wherefore doth lysander deny your love so rich within his soul and tender me forsooth affection but by your setting on but by your consent what though i be not so in grace as you so hung upon with love so fortunate but miserable most to love unloved this you should pity rather than despise i understand not what you mean by this i do persevere counterfeit sad looks make mouths upon me when i turn my back wink at each other hold the sweet jest up this sport well carried shall be chronicled if you have any pity grace or manners you would not make me such an argument but fare you well tis partly my own fault which death or absence soon shall remedy stay gentle helena hear my excuse my love my life my soul fair helena oh excellent sweet do not scorn her so if she cannot entreat i can compel thou canst compel no more than she entreat thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers helen i love thee by my life i do i swear by that which i will lose for thee to prove him false that says i love thee not i say i love thee more than he can do if thou say so withdraw and prove it too quick come lysander whereto tends all this away you ethiope no no he'll seem to break loose take on as you would follow but yet come not you are a tame man go hang off thou cat thou burr vile thing let loose or i will shake thee from me like a serpent why are you grown so rude what change is this sweet love thy love 
Out, tawny tartar, out! Out, loathed medicine, hated potion, hence! Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What, should I hurt her, strike her, kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What, can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me? Wherefore? Oh, me, what news, my love? Am I not Hermia? Are not you Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why, then you left me, oh, the gods forbid, in earnest, shall I say? I, by my life, and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain nothing truer, tis no jest, that I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh, me, you juggler, you canker-blossom, you thief of love! What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine, i' faith! Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you! Puppet? Why so? Ay, that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height, forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. Are you grown so high in his esteem, because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach unto thine eyes. I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed, I have no gift at all in shrewishness, I am a right maid for my cowardice, let her not strike me. You perhaps may think, because she is something lower than myself, that I can match her. Lower? Hark, again. Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia, did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you, save that in love unto Demetrius I told him of your stealth unto this wood. He followed you. For love I followed him, but he hath chid me hence, and threatened me to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too, and now, so you will let me quiet go, to Athens will I bear my folly back, and follow you no further. Let me go, you see how simple and how fond I am. Why, get you gone, who is it that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid, she shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not though you take her part. Oh, when she's angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Little again, nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Get you gone, you dwarf, you minimus, of hindering knotgrass maid, you bead, you acorn. You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. Speak not of Helena, take not her part, for if thou dost intend never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Now she holds me not, now follow if thou darest to try whose right of thine or mine is most in Helena. Follow? Nay, I'll go with thee, cheek by jowl. Exeunt Lysander and Demetrius. You, mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you, I, nor longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands than mine are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer, though, to run away. Exit. I am amazed, and know not what to say. Exit. This is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest, or else committest thy knaveries willfully. Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garment he had on? and so far blameless proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes, and so far am I glad it so did sort, as this their jangling I esteem a sport. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight, hide thee therefore, Robin, or cast the night, the starry welkin cover thou anon with drooping fog as black as Acheron, and lead these testy rivals so astray, as one come not within another's way. Like to Lysander, sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, 
and some time rail thou like Demetrius, and from each other look thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep, with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property, to take from thence all error with his might, and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend, with league whose date till death shall never end. Whiles I in this affair to thee employ, I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy, and then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view, and all things shall be peace. My fairy lord, this must be done with haste, for night's swift dragons cut the clouds full fast, and yonder shines Aurora's harbinger, at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards, damned spirits all that in crossways and floods have burial, already to their wormy beds are gone, for fear lest day should look their shames upon, they wilfully themselves exile from light, and must for aye consort with black-browed night. But we are spirits of another sort. I with the morning's love have oft made sport, and like a forester the groves may tread, even till the eastern gate, all fiery red, opening on Neptune with fair blessed beams, turns into yellow gold his salt-green streams. But notwithstanding, haste, make no delay, we may effect this business yet ere day. Exit. Up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town. Goblin, lead them up and down. Here comes one. Re-enter Lysander. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, villain, drawn and ready. Where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me, then, to plainer ground. Exit Lysander as following the voice. Re-entered Demetrius. Lysander, speak again. Thou runaway, thou coward, art thou fled? Speak. In some bush, where dost thou hide thy head? Thou, coward, art thou bragging to the stars, telling the bushes that thou look'st for wars, and wilt not come? Come, recreant, come, thou child, I'll whip thee with a rod, he is defiled that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice. We'll try no manhood here. Exeunt. Re-enter Lysander. He goes before me and still dares me on. When I come where he calls, then he is gone. The villain is much lighter heeled than I. I followed fast, but faster did he fly that fallen am I in dark, uneven way, and here will rest me. Lies down. Come, thou gentle day, for if but once thou show me thy grey light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. Sleeps. Re-enter Puck and Demetrius. Ha, <laughs> coward! Why comest thou not? Abide me if thou darest, for well I wot, thou runnest before me, shifting every place, and darest not stand nor look me in the face. <laughs> Where art thou now? Come hither, I am here. Nay, then, thou mockest me. Thou shalt buy this dear, if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. Faintness constraineth me to measure out my length on this cold bed. By day's approach look to be visited. Lies down and sleeps. Re-enter Helena. O oh, weary night, O oh, long and tedious night, abate thy hour. Shine comforts from the east, that I may back to Athens by daylight, from these that my poor company detest, and sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye. Steal me away from mine own company. Lies down and sleeps. Yet but three, come one more. Two of both kinds make up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Re-enter Hermia. Never so weary, never so in woe, Bedabbled with the dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. 
Heaven's shield, Lysander, if they mean a fray. Lies down and sleeps. On the ground sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover, remedy. Squeezing the juice on Lysander's eyes. When thou wakest, thou takes true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye, and the country proverb known that every man should take his own, in your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, nought shall go ill, the man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Exit. End of Act Three of A Midsummer Night's Dream.